But look at the shot right here as we're looking straight up. You can see how the building really soars up, but yet he's breaking down the scale of the building to something humans understand. You, you know, you have panels that are as wide as a man's hand. Does it, uh, does it yeah. make you want to rub your face against it? <laughs> <laughs> it makes you want to hug the building. That's what it makes you want to do. Welcome to downtown Buffalo again on a uh, wintry day here uh, in downtown. We're standing at the intersection of Main and Church Street and we're looking at uh, two of Buffalo's most beautiful and architecturally accomplished buildings. Uh, the first building is Richard Upjohn's wonderful St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral from 1849 to 1851 and beyond it uh, one of the icons of modern architecture internationally, uh, Lewis Sullivan's Guarantee Building of 1895-1896. Richard Upjohn, an East Coast architect from New York City, he was the man who really popularized the Gothic Revival in the United States. The hallmark of the Gothic style is an emphasis on verticality and the pointed arch. And you'll see in the windows here and the doorways of St. Paul's arches that come to a point. You see that the elevation, the gable, is flanked by pinnacles which break through the roof line. That's part of the verticality of the Gothic Revival and why, in fact, in England very often it's called the perpendicular style. Emphasis on tall. But Upjohn does something very well. He designs every facade, every part of the building to give visual pleasure so that it works both architecturally and functionally. Everything is frontage. You can enter the building from two of the sides, the side along Erie Street, which is the great boulevard down to the waterfront, is really a great exhibition of Gothic architecture along the length of the nave. And the reason for the tall, narrow windows is because stone cannot support great spans. So if you want to get light inside of a building and you're building with stone, you have no choice but to build a very tall window to let enough light in and you have to have an arch. And the weight of the building, when it hits the arch, the arch distributes the weight of the building off to the sides and to the ground. And that's what's happening over here. As we look at the Guarantee Building, we can see, wow, something has really changed. Within 50 years, Louis Sullivan, uh, architect from the West, from Chicago, uh, comes and also designs a building with the emphasis on tall in a way, though, that no one had at that point been able to do. The 19th century was a period of great architectural and technological change. We were uh, introducing things like electrical power, the safety elevator, the steel frame. For a period, in the 1870s and 1880s, buildings were getting larger, they were getting taller, but architects uh, were stuck kind of with the way architecture had always been. Since you couldn't have, practically speaking, a building much taller than four or five stories, that's how architecture developed. It developed so that aesthetically it could handle that height. And if you look at the Ellicott Square building, for example, uh, by Burnham and Root, just a couple years earlier than the Guarantee, you'll see that although it's almost as tall as the Guarantee building, it actually consists of a series of shorter buildings, in fact, stacked one on top of the other, three, four-story segments, and then finally totaling 10 stories, whereas the Guarantee building is a bit different. Uh, what Lewis Sullivan is doing is he's saying, well, this is a tall building and the key thing here is to emphasize the quality of tallness. But at the same time, he doesn't want to do it in a way that's really going to disorientate people. So he's thinking, okay, what can I draw on that people are going to be familiar with and yet express the height of the building? And he goes back to ancient Greek architecture and the column. And he says, oh, okay, my building is going to be like a column. It's going to have a base, a shaft, and a capital. And if you look at the building over here, you can clearly see a two-story base 
uh, very heavy holding up the building. The main part of the building, the shaft of the building, uh, emphasizing uh, the height. And how does he emphasize the height? He has a series of undifferentiated windows, just a grid of windows. He's saying all these functions are the same. They're all offices, so I'm going to show them to be the same on the exterior and I'm going to put them in a frame. And the frame is, uh, what I'm going to do is push back the spandrels. That's the area between the windows and between the vertical elements, the pilasters. And then what's going to happen is the vertical element, the pilasters, will, will spring out and emphasize the height of the building. And then the top of the building, I'm going to have a very heavy cornice which would be the capital of a, a Greek column. And you can see here, he has a, indeed a, a really rich three-dimensional uh, corners here with circular windows at the top, capping the building very emphatically. So this was really the most famous building of the late 19th century. He explicitly was looking for a new type of architecture. He wrote an essay on it, in fact, for Ladies Home Journal, explaining exactly what he was trying to do here. And in that essay, he coined the phrase, form ever follows function, uh, to explain exactly uh, what he was doing over here. So it's a, it's a great building architecturally, but also it's a very good building urbanistically. Wonderful ornamentation of the wall surface. This is something you don't really see today, but it's something Sullivan was enamored of. Very rich terracotta ornamentation. And uh, the terracotta is nothing but the same material that uh, one makes flower pots out of. It's baked earth. But uh, what you're able to do is create a mold and then uh, just spit out thousands of copies of that mold, and that's what happens here. You, you can see here, these are blocks of terracotta. They're all repeated. But look at the texture, very wonderfully scaled. When we're standing here, when you're walking along this, your eye can pick out a, a detail, this little uh, swirl over here, the, the dots, the triangles, the chevron shape over here. This is really wonderful. You can see the three-dimensional aspect of it. And uh, this is not the case on a lot of uh, modern buildings. There's uh, just sheer panels of uh, stone or more often glass or steel. We see the Rath building and the Erie County Savings Bank building. And you can see the point of uh, how the base of the building is so important. But the notion in the 60s was, no, the geometry of the building is what it's important. So we've got to have an absolutely flat base on which to place our magnificent sculptural depiction of banality. And <laughs> unfortunately, that's what's going on here with the Rath County office building. Uh, as opposed to the care that Sullivan and other architects were taking, at the base of the building, because that's where the public meets the building. Citizens meet the building at the base. So they were very conscious of designing their openings, their detailing and everything. So related to people on the sidewalk, that's emphatically not the case over here. And uh, bizarrely, the, the Rath building, it has a exterior corridor, or one would have called it an arcade, pressed back from the front of the building. And then the wall there for two stories is sheathed in black. I mean, it's already in shadow, and then you're doing it in black, so it looks kind of sinister, foreboding. And, uh, geez, is that what you want to project to the public in a, uh, what is your county office building, where your county legislature is, your county executive? It should be a dignifying, ennobling building. Old City and County Hall from 1876. Great example. I mean, here you have a wonderful clock tower. There, there's some meaning here, some dignity. And uh, as a citizen walking up to this building, you would have felt ennobled. You would have said, wow, this is the house of the people. Activity which is going on here is important. The building is beautiful. There are plenty of windows. It's approachable while still being majestic. It's a good example of how, despite the fact that genius resides across the street, it does not necessarily mean that it's going to inspire and inform uh, the work of other subsequent architects. What it takes is kind of the assist, insistence of citizens that, listen, we have to build well. We've had great architects working here, Daniel Burnham, uh, Lewis Sullivan, and our 
new architecture should not only attempt to be as beautiful as the old architecture, but also function well on an urban level for the citizens who use the buildings. Great architecture is, it, the architects are designing something which succeeding generations will defend and want to save, rather than look at and say, boy, tear it down. So great architecture, it almost saves itself. It, it, it saves itself. It uh, gets very quickly into the hearts, minds, and affections of citizens. And that's what happened uh, with the Guarantee Building.